Um, so the topic of this talk, or at least the official title of the talk, is Fishing Tips and Techniques. I realized afterwards that um, an alternative title could have been something like Hacking the Mind, because there's a lot of um, information in here about sort of the, the way human cognitive processes work and their interaction with usability in, in things like web browsers. So the background for this is, OK, just some standard figures. There's who knows how much money being made from fishing. Um, we know that it's a serious problem. We know um, that it works really, really well. What we don't know is the general reason why it works. Um, a typical reason why is that users are idiots, which isn't really a good reason. Um, so what I wanted to look at is basically the nuts and bolts of, of why, it, why it works. So first of all, what are the actual threats that we're facing from the fishers? And what are the weak points in our defenses? So the obvious question to why users can't get security right is that users are idiots. Um, and that's an actual um, thing from Slashdot where someone says pretty much that. And that's a typical opinion you hear when you ask security people about uh, the users they have to deal with. Well, users are idiots. We build all these cool security countermeasures. Users get them wrong. It's not our fault. But the problem with this is that given how successful phishing is, that would assume that almost everyone on Earth is an idiot. You know, joking aside about stupid users, um, the fact that so many people are becoming victims of phishing attacks and that phishing is so successful implies that there is a fundamental problem that isn't being addressed by security technology. Um, so what developers have done is they've created a whole pile of widgets for, for browsers and similar applications. I'm going to concentrate mostly on browsers because most of the phishing is done via browsers. So you've got things like the padlock icon, you've got the HTTPS indicator. Um, in Firefox and the next version of Internet Explorer, there's a colored URL bar, certificate warnings, and you've also got optional browser plugins that tell you, for example, this is PayPal or this may be a phishing site or whatever. The problem with this is that it was never actually ever tested on users. So developers stuck it in. They thought, this sounds like a good idea. Let's stick it in. They never actually tested whether this works. Uh, there's a human computer interaction um, sort of principle which says that if users don't understand it, it's not there. Um, so, you know, if users don't understand the padlock, you may as well not have it because it's not going to be used and it's not going to be effective. So last year, um, a group actually did some testing on whether these mechanisms were usable. So whether users were actually being helped by the padlock and HTTPS and so on and so forth. And they found out that, well, you've got the figures there, you know, 65% ignored the padlock, 59% paid no attention to the HTTPS. Um, more than three quarters didn't even notice the address bar colouring. And in this particular test, of the, the people that noticed, only two actually knew what it meant. The rest thought it was just some sort of decoration. Um, and most importantly, you know, the, the prime sort of security feature behind SSL, or basically web browsing, is that you use SSL, you use certificates. The assumption is that if you've got an invalid certificate or some sort of problem, then users will know not to go to that site. What this test found is that 68% of users, once this warning dialog popped up, clicked OK without even knowing, knowing what they were doing. So it's not just that they read the thing and didn't you know, know what to do and clicked OK. It was a reflex action. They just got rid of this warning and connected to the site no matter what. Um, only one single user in this test was able to explain what they'd actually done. So a standard sort of approach to this is, well, OK, we need to educate users. We need to tell them what the, the padlock means and what the certificate means and so on and so forth. <coughs> As it turns out, we've been educating, or at least miseducating users for years. Every time you go online, you get DNS errors and 404 errors and missing plugins and JavaScript and your security settings don't allow this to be run and so on and so forth. So users expect to be constantly bombarded with all these irritating little minor warnings and things. And they've come to accept that if you just click OK or cancel, and in some cases try again in half an hour, it's going to work. So you've got this constant stream of warnings, dialogue, pop warning, you know, error dialogues and so on and so forth. And they've conditioned users into ignoring them. Now the problem is if you get a network attack, you get symptoms that are exactly identical to these standard, the standard you know, three degree background radiation of noise that users expect. So basically what happens is the browser is trying to detect these attacks with a 100% false positive rate. Here's an example. Um, you fire up Windows, first time you use it, you go to eBay, you search for dog food, you get that warning dialogue. This dialogue tells you absolutely nothing about what you're doing. You're going to send information to the internet. Well, yes, obviously, you're surfing the net. You have to send information to the net. So it's a pretty much meaningless dialogue. Um, there's no context for it. If you go to eBay for dog food, you get this dialogue. If you go to your banking website, you get the same dialogue. 
Um, even the programmers admit that this dialogue is a complete waste of time. You see the checkbox at the bottom that says don't bother me again. So even the people that created this dialogue realise that you don't want to see this and it's just a, just a noise. Um, that's a translation of the dialogue into you know, what the users actually obtain from this. That's all that the users actually absorb. And again, the Windows developers, and I'm going to use Windows specifically as an example because it's the most used platform, but on other, other platforms are not much better. Um, the Windows developers actually realize that users aren't going to understand this. So in Windows 95, one of the betas, um, they actually put in an error message saying that in order to demonstrate our superior intellect, we're going to ask you a question you can't answer. Um, because they, you know, the developers knew that they were doing things that the users would not understand. So basically we have, you know, from the last sort of 10 years or so, we've got an entire generation whose computing experience is based around clicking OK to error messages they don't understand. Um, so in general, you know, if you're talking about general secu security, sorry, general usability, not specifically security usability, OK, that's just moaning about bad design. The problem is, once that becomes security usability, it's a really, really serious security flaw and it's a primary attack vector. Here's some examples. Um, there was a large banking site about a year ago whose certificate expired. So every time you went to this bank site, you got this pop-up saying the certificate is invalid and, you know, the standard browser error warning. Um, during the time when that certificate was invalid, 300 users visited the site, one single user turned away. So basically the certificate warning had no effect whatsoever in preventing users from going to the site. Uh, and the problem with this is, as I've already mentioned earlier, that SSL security depends entirely on the user handling of certificates. So if you look at this sort of chain, you've got you know, 128 bit AES and 2000 bit RSA keys, and then this user judgment call in front of a dialog box. Um, so obviously you know, no one's gonna bother attacking AES encryption or RSA. They simply go for the weakest link, which is the user in front of the dialog box. And that's why phishing is so incredibly successful, because that is the weak link, and that's the attack vector that everyone's using. Again, this is an example from a government site that was used to make property tax payments. So it's thousands to tens of thousands of dollars per payment made through this site. And at the bottom you can see um, a, a standard certificate warning, a big thing, invalid certificate, a red cross. So the security mechanisms are, mechanisms are working exactly as they were intended to work. On the other hand, the effect on users was apparently nothing. Uh, that was up there for about two months before someone told them to fix it. So either zero or close to zero users were actually deterred by this particular warning, even though that was exactly what the browser designers had intended. So the first phishing tip, invalid certificates don't bother users. Um, I'll get onto this, uh, go into this in a bit more detail later on. So another problem we've got is that financial institutions are actually training the users to ignore these certificate-based security indicators. These are three typical screenshots from large, well-known financial institutions. And what all of them are saying is that when you go to our homepage, there's no padlock, there's no HTTPS, there's no security whatsoever, but you know, go ahead, we're a large bank, trust us, just enter your password details anyway. So again, obvious phishing tip from that, target US financial institutions. Um, they have the worst online security of any banks anywhere. Um, and a sort of a follow-on for that is that users are heavily conditioned towards accepting these security practices. So again, with these sort of messages on their homepages, you know, they've basically trained their users to accept very poor security practices. Um, and then there's, there's sort of, depending on geographic region, they sort of go from really appalling all the way through to reasonably good. The, the European banks are quite good. Um, they use things like PIN calculators and smart cards and TANs, which are per transaction PINs. So you log into account, you use a PIN, and then every time you move money around, you have to enter a one-time, um, what they call a TAN, which is a per transaction PIN to authorize that individual transaction. So they're a much harder target to attack. So the results of this conditioning of users is that um, SSL security isn't really very effective. Um, if you look at the security space survey, they found that about 58% of all SSL certificates are invalid. That means they're expired, they're self-signed, they're signed by unknown CAs, they're for an incorrect domain, and so on and so forth. Um, usually people don't see this. Most people go to Amazon and Hotmail and whatever. Um, and these certificates are valid, so they don't see this vast mass of invalid certificates. But once you go to the smaller sites, you start running into these invalid certificates. The problem with this is that browser vendors can't afford to fix it anymore. Um, the majority, or at least 58% of websites would break if browsers suddenly started refusing to connect to a site that has an invalid certificate. So for example, if Microsoft fixes it, um, the complaint will be, well, they'll be using their monopoly position to force everyone to buy VeriSign certificates. It won't fly. 
Um, conversely, if any of the other browsers fix it, the complaint will be, well, it works with Internet Explorer. It doesn't work with, say, Firefox. Therefore, Firefox is broken. So the browsers have a very, uh, sorry, the browser vendors have a very serious problem in, in trying to fix this. So again, the study I commented earlier that showed you know, the effects of the padlock and so on um, found that certificates basically had zero effect on people visiting a website. Um, it was pretty much indistinguishable from placebo. And there's a, there's a comment from that study. Um, users basically dismiss the error messages, and so they have very little protection against man-in-the-middle attacks. In other words, the very thing that they were designed to protect against, they're not actually doing. Um, there's, an, there's a mechanism used for accepting sort of small cash payments. I don't know if it's used much in the US. Um, it's, it's used in some countries outside the US called an honesty box. So if you've got something like a newspaper or whatever, you have, a, you have an honesty box next to it, and you trust that most people are honest, so they're going to drop in the right amount of money before they take the newspaper. And it works most of the time. Typically, it's used in situations where it's not worth having someone sitting there counting the money and making sure that you know, people are paying the right amount. And that's pretty much the same security as what ECCL certificates to, um, get you. You spend $500 on a VeriSign certificate, and people will visit your site. You use a $9.95 budget CA certificate, people will still come. You create a self-signed certificate, exactly the same as the $500 VeriSign one. You use an invalid certificate, again, they'll still come in. And if you're a bank, you just put up a nice warning message saying, you know, don't worry, there's no security indicators here, but trust us, we're a bank. And again, people will still come. So if you're buying newspapers for sort of 50 cents, it doesn't matter if you lose the odd 50 cent deposit. On the other hand, if you're up against crooks who are, de who are determined to always be dishonest every single time, then this provides basically zero security. So there's one other interesting thing that the study found. Um, it found that users treated a site with no certificates at all as being less secure than one with an invalid certificate. Um, what they assumed was that if there's a certificate there, okay, it's expired, but you know, it's a certificate, so it's good enough, it's got to be good for something. And if you think about this, um, if you go into a lift or an elevator, um, there's a certificate in there. Does anyone here, just to get a show of hands, does anyone here ever check the security certificate in an elevator? So a safety certificate. Has anyone, ch okay. Has anyone checked that the safety certificate in the um, elevator actually matches both the building and the elevator they're travelling in? <laughs> okay, well, very paranoid people, which is basically what, uh, what, what you need to do to validate an SSL certificate. And, you know, that's the example that people have from, re from real world usage. If you go into a restaurant, you may possibly glance at the, the food safety certificate on the wall while you're waiting for your, you know, to be seated. But in general, people don't check to that level of detail. And when they go to a website, they get the same thing. It's got a certificate. It's good enough for me. So the result of this is it's a, not only is it indistinguishable from placebo, it's actually worse than placebo in that uh, users behave less insecurely when they go to a site with no SSL than when they go to a site with SSL. Obvious fishing tip from that. Um, Use a self-signed certificate because it gets you a lot more respect than not using any certificate at all. And the fishers are starting to realize this. So last year alone, there were about 450 secure phishing attacks that are known. There are probably who knows how many more that weren't actually realized. Um, the two sort of main ones, apart from the obvious cross-site scripting, is self-signed certificate. And you get a genuine certificate for a sound-alike domain. For example, um, that was a real site that used uh, SSL, visasecure.com. The issue with that is that Visa actually use things like Verified by Visa and Visa Bucks and so on and so forth. So if you're used to domains like that and you see VisaSecure.com, there's no reason that you can, for, for a typical person, not to believe that that is a genuine Visa site and it's got a certificate issued by a trusted CA, it has to be the real thing. Okay, so that was some of the sort of the actual problems in terms of user interface. Now I'm going to look into the actual background, the nuts and bolts of why users behave in this manner, why they simply get rid of these dialogues. Um, up until about 20 odd years ago, it was assumed that the human decision making model was something called the economic decision making model. So that assumes that you've got a, you, you generate a set of alternatives, you sort of weigh them up, you decide this is the best one, I'll go with this one. Um, the problem is that in many situations, and in, in this particular example, battlefield decision making, uh, humans make really, really bad decisions. So if you follow the economic decision making model, that shouldn't really happen. So the US Department of Defense commissioned a study to find out how these decisions are actually being made. And they found that in, the, in this particular case, which I'll go into in a minute, um, the way users make decisions is that they simply generate options one at a time. They never compare any of the two options. They generate options one at a time. They take the first one that matches. If it doesn't fit that well, they throw it away and go on to the next one. 
Um, it's something called the singular evaluation approach. And it's very, very different from the way that, you know, that um, people were expected to make decisions. So if you look at things like web browsers, they were based on this particular decision-making model and not at all on the way that people are actually making decisions. So the situations when you switch from the economic model to the singular evaluation is when you're under pressure, which is pretty much automatic if you're using a computer. You know, you want to do your online banking and some stupid dialogue pops up. You want to get, it, get rid of it as quickly as possible. So you're automatically under pressure. Um, when you're dynamic conditions, so you can't really perform detailed analysis, you can't sit back and think about all the possible options. And when you've got very little basis for analyzing and comparing choices. And again, in this case, you know, with these complicated certificate-based messages, users have no idea what that's talking about. Um, this is typically uh, just another example screenshot I used. That's the American Express homepage, which has an invalid certificate. Um, but again, it doesn't seem to stop people from going there. So when you're dealing with computers, you use this all the time. Um, it saves time and effort. Whenever you get a pointless pop-up dialog, you just take the f make the first decision you can to get rid of the thing, which is to click OK or cancel. Um, and in fact, the, the web browsing model itself encourages this kind of poke and hope thing. So you go to a website, you click on something, it's not the right link, you go back, you try something else, you go back. So the fact that users are using web browsers, the actual environment they're working within is conditioning them as they're using it to use this type of decision making means that um, you know, an attack that takes advantage of that is, is extremely powerful. Because web users are basically constantly immersed inside the singular evaluation environment. So the reason why humans do this is that if they didn't, they wouldn't actually get anything done. Um, it's not some you know, defect or bug in the way the brain works. It's what makes humans function. Um, AI researchers have actually tried to do this. So they've tried to computerize um, singular evaluation or at least sort of computerized common sense, I guess would be a better way of putting it. And the software's had to grind through millions and millions of possible implications in order to come up with this decision. Um, so AI researchers call this the frame problem. How do you frame a particular problem in such a way that it's easy to solve? Um, some humans actually don't use singular evaluation. They use the, the sort of economic model for everything they do. And that's a psychological disorder called somatizing catatonic conversion, which is the catatonic. Um, <coughs> may indicate what happens is that you simply grind to a halt. Because every single action you take, you have to go through all the possible implications, and you never actually get anything done. So if, users, if humans did exclusively use this economic decision-making model, they wouldn't work. Um, it's not a bug. It's required for humans to function. So you know, this isn't grumbling about stupid users. That's basically a law of nature. You can't educate users out of this. You can't avoid this. You have to deal with this. Um, and more importantly, you can't patch this in a hurry. It's always going to be there. And you know, th things like salespeople, for example, already know about this. So maybe they haven't got into the heavy-duty psychology stuff, but they know that you know, if you say something like, call in the next 10 minutes, then people switch from the economic model, where they'll realize that what they're buying is a pile of crap, to the singular evaluation model, where they say, OK, I've got to act really, really quickly, I'll miss out on the deal, and I'll go and buy it. So another problem that, um, that comes about from the way that humans do things is the difference between uh, automatic and control processes. So a control process is something that's it's relatively slow, it requires a lot of mental effort, but on the other hand, it gives you a great deal of flexibility. So an example of this is if you're a novice driver, um, you have to manually check for things and change gears and look out for pedestrians and traffic lights and so on and so forth. It, re it requires quite a bit of mental effort. But the fact that you're specifically going through and checking for all these things um, gives you a great deal of flexibility. The opposite of that is an automatic process, um, which is what an experienced driver has. So they will, they will automatically, without really being consciously aware of it, check for traffic lights and signs and whatnot. The feature of an automatic process is it's very quick to do, requires very little um, mental effort, and you're basically acting on autopilot. So the thing with humans is they're creatures of habit. Um, if you have an automatic process, it's triggered by certain stimuli. Once that um, trigger happens, it's very, very hard to stop an automatic process. And another thing is you're not actually consciously aware of doing it. Example of this is locking the front door. You get halfway down the drive and you think, did I lock the front door? It's an automatic process. You do it every single day. You don't think about it. You're not conscious of having done it. And so at some point you realize, I, don't, I can't actually remember ever having locked the front door because it was simply never recorded. So the thing with this is that once users become habituated into a certain behavior, it's very, very difficult to break them out of this. Um, one thing that Microsoft found, for example, if you're running XP Service Pack 2 
you'll note that they've actually turned the security update thing into nagware. So every couple of minutes, the stupid thing pops up again and says, you have updates, do you, wanna, do you want me to restart the machine? Um, Microsoft didn't do this because they like annoying users. They, what they found in user testing was that people would just automatically click away this update dialog. So they'd automatically download the updates. This thing would pop up. Users wouldn't even be aware they'd done this. They'd just move the mouse to the OK or cancel or close or whatever and get rid of it. And so you had this massive amount of security updates that were sitting there unapplied, and users weren't actually aware that they were preventing them from being applied. This is something that's been known about for a long time, the very, very sort of the dark ages of psychology. Um, the very first psychologists realized that users basically resist attempts to change their behavior. So once they've become habituated into this bad habit, um, then even if you go to them and say what you're doing is wrong, they still won't change their behavior. And software vendors have tried to work around this. The most notorious example probably is you know, the Microsoft Office paperclip. Hey, I've noticed you're doing this in a really long-winded and stupid way. Here's, a, here's two keystrokes that you can do it. And users really, really hated it. So a consequence of this is that every time you go online, you have to endlessly authenticate yourself. Um, this is a um, screenshot from Firefox. So you've got one example, which is a, um, a blog for discussing knitting patterns. And the other one is PayPal. And either one, with no difference in obvious difference in the security levels, you go to that, you have to authenticate yourself. And I'm going to sort of complain about Firefox. Internet Explorer is no better. Um, I just use this as an example. Um, so when Firefox asks you for this master password, you have no idea of telling, is this a high security thing, is this a low security thing? So if you participate in, let's say, 100 different blogs, every blog you go to, you have to type in your password automatically without even thinking about it. Um, and again, that's something officials are taking advantage of, the fact that every time a password dialog pops up, you simply type in your password as an automatic process. And in fact, even, even you know, legitimate applications requests for passwords are pretty much incomprehensible, um, let alone a phishing site. So um, that what that actually says is, is I'll, I'll just read it out loud if you can't see it at the back, it's please enter the master password for the software security device with a very useful heading prompt at the top. Um, just to give an explanation of what that is actually saying, okay, for, for the average um, non-technical user, that's complete gobbledygook. All they can see there is, is that thing at the bottom, um, which might as well be Klingon. They can see the enter and password, everything else they can't understand, it's just jargon. And just for the trekkies in the audience, yes, I realize it's not proper Klingon, because you can't say please enter your password in Klingon, so it's, it's actually just garbage. <laughs> so. <laughs> So even for technical users, you know, to understand what that's actually asking, you have to know that the Netscape-derived browsers use internally a um, crypto API called PKCS11, and, uh, which is designed generally for smart cards and crypto hardware. But most people don't have that, so they have a software emulation of a PKCS11 crypto device. And the PKCS11 standard specifies two different types of sessions you can have to a device, a public session and a private session. The public session will let you read certificates and stuff like that. The private session will give you access to keys. And so in order to access the keys on this pseudo crypto hardware device, you have to authenticate yourself with a password. So what this is saying is please enter a password to establish a private session with the PKCS11 software emulation crypto device built into the browser. Nobody will understand that. You know, this is, this is going beyond just the average user not understanding it, even most geeks, I think, unless they know a lot about how PKCS11 crypto interfaces work, will not have a clue what that dialogue is actually really saying apart from enter password. So users are basically um, habituated into entering their passwords for everything. Any dialogue that pops up, they enter their password. It's an automatic process. Once the stimulus appears, once something appears with the word password on the dialogue box, they type in their password. Um, biometrics are going to be even more brilliant. I read this cool article about uh, one or two weeks before I came here, which was about biometrics for, for protecting against phishing. It never actually explained how they were going to do this. It was a long thing about how fingerprint readers work. But biometrics are going to be even worse for this because biometrics are even easier to enter. You know, you've got this fingerprint reader here, click, authenticated, dialog box, click, authenticated. So becoming habituated into that and that becoming an automatic process is even easier than typing in your password. So it's far more vulnerable, actually, than, than straight passwords. So some phishing tips derived from that. Um, you know, because of this lack of differentiation between high and low value passwords, try phishing for a low value site. Most people, okay, maybe if they go to a particular banking site, they might be a bit more careful. If they're going to a blog site, they're not really going to care because the password isn't worth anything. 
Um, at the moment, fishing for banking sites is still so easy that it's not really worth doing this. On the other hand, if the banks ever get their act together, um, that's one thing you can try and do. And then obviously try the fish credentials at high value sites, so you get someone's Hotmail password and try it at Bank of America. Um, another interesting thing you can do, again based on this, this automatic process thing, is you reject the first few passwords the user enters. So they type in their password without even thinking about it, and you get the thing back, invalid password. So you've typed in your password, you weren't even aware you were doing it, you weren't aware which password you typed in. Okay, maybe I typed in the wrong password, I'll try a password for a different site. No, okay, I'll try a third password. So basically you can get several passwords for the price of one. <coughs> so another problem with the way, with uh, human minds is they're very bad at generating testable hypotheses. Um, and in particular, they will try to confirm something rather than to um, prove it invalid. Is that the, so humans exhibit something called confirmation bias. So they go to a website, and instead of saying, I'm going to try these things to check whether it's a fake site, they say, I'm going to try these things to try and confirm that it is the real site. Um, a consequence of this is that people are more likely to accept an invalid but plausible conclusion rather than a valid but implausible one. So again, from real user testing, here's an example of how, how this, uh, this confirmation bias problem pops up. You go to a site, how do you check whether it's for real? Well, you type in your username and password, and if it accepts them, then obviously it knows that that was your password and you know it's the real thing. Um, this is absolutely appalling. You know, if security people look at this, this is absolutely appalling. But this was from real user testing. This is how users try and verify potential phishing sites. Humans are really, really good at rationalizing away almost anything. Um, this is a really extreme case. Um, there are some patients who have epileptic seizures that are so, so severe that the only way to really treat them is to physically separate the two brain hemispheres. And so what psychologists did with those is they told one half of the brain to do something in, in one particular experiment, it was get up and walk around the room. And then they asked the other half of the brain why they were doing that. Now, because they were physically separated, one half of the brain literally had no idea what the other half of the brain was doing. And yet they always came up with some rationalization, like I wanted to stretch my legs, I wanted to get up for a drink, whatever. So, you know, that's a kind of an extreme example. Humans can always come up with some plausible explanation for something, even if they have absolutely no idea why it's actually happening. Um, and here's an example of how that works in, in the case of phishing. Okay, so you've got a bank site located in an unexpected place. Um, again, this is from user testing. These are actual genuine user responses towards, you know, why is this thing located in some really weird location. Um, and all of them kind of make sense. You know, SSL, yahoo.com, okay, it's a subdirectory of Yahoo. Some site in Brazil, well, they have a branch in Brazil, so obviously that's why I'm getting sent there. Um, I've had to go to websites that are simply IP addresses rather than proper URLs, and so on and so forth. And it's very easy to rationalize that. So the phishing tip from that is people basically really, really want to believe what they see. So just create a very good copy of the site, and it doesn't matter if it's in Romania, they'll still believe it. Um, and you know, exploit the confirmation bias. So make it very easy to confirm the site's authenticity based on these, these sort of, well, basically stupid things, unless you realize that's how the user's brains work, um, these stupid ways of testing things. So another problem is that financial institutions in the real world have invested a great deal in anti-counterfeiting technology. So you know, if you look at banknotes, you've got watermarks and um, you know, things printed in see-through register and taglio printing and a whole pile of other stuff. And that's all based on the fact that it's very, very difficult to replicate certain physical security artifacts. So the result of that is that people assume that complexity means authentication, authenticity. So if you go to a website and it's got a whole pile of you know, flash animation and animated graphics and really complicated layout, they assume that just like a banknote and a check and so on with anti-counterfeiting measures, that because of all this complicated detail in there, that must be the real thing because if you've got a flash animation, for someone to sit down there and manually copy all the little details of this flash animation across onto their site would be extremely difficult. They just assume that the digital world follows physical copying rules. So exploit that. And again, this is from, from actual phishing tests and usability tests. So if you've got a site that's using Flash and animated graphics and so on and so forth, um, copy that and very prominently feature it on, on the home page. And that's something users have actually said. You know, They went to a phishing site and they had said there was this animated dancing bear or something on this site. And I trusted it because it had this really complicated animated graphic that the fishers couldn't possibly have forged. Um, one thing you have to be careful with if you're just sort of slipping down the entire website is be careful with very literal copies. Um, if you've got things like dates and stuff on there, you can't just take a snapshot of the site. You actually have to be, you know, maybe parse it and update dates and other things like that. 
But as long as the site looks plausible, um, it'll actually work because the user assumption is that no one will bother creating an entire fake site like this and copying every single feature. Um, that's an actual phishing site. And um, this is, so the example I gave earlier of these banks that put little padlock pictures on their home pages and then have a message saying, you know, there's no SSL but trust us. So that's the actual padlock. And the difference between the Bank of America site and the phishing site was the Bank of America site, you click on the padlock and it displays a message saying, you know, we have no security but trust us. And on the phishing site, you click on that padlock and nothing happens. So these people just have no pride in their work. They couldn't even copy the simple uh, bank site. <laughs> So there's something called the Simon Says problem, um, which hits browsers a lot. And what that is is when you expect it to change your behavior in the absence of a stimulus. So not the presence, but the absence of a stimulus. So in web browsers, you've basically got this tiny little padlock. And when the padlock is absent, you're supposed to treat the site as being not so secure. The problem with this is the hamming weight of that is basically close to zero. Users simply don't notice it. Um, when, the, when Internet Explorer 6 Service Pack 2, they introduced this tiny little blue ribbon, um, which indicated that I think it was a pop-up had been blocked or something like that. And some folks did a usability test on it after Microsoft had released it and found that not one single user actually noticed that this security ribbon was there. And this has happened in, in a lot of other cases as well. Um, there was a case where some folks were doing some testing on a spreadsheet, and they had this little pop-up dialog box that came up saying, there's a $50 bill taped to the bottom of your seat, take it. And no one noticed it, and no one took this $50 bill, even though this thing popped up in the middle of when they were using the uh, spreadsheet. So there's a whole sort of science about this called inattention blindness. It's only been studied in the last couple of years. It's actually a really, really interesting read, if, if, if you don't mind sort of reading psychology test, texts. Um, one of the best-known examples of this, which people here may have seen because it's been shown on TV in a number of programs, Two psychologists, Simons and Chabris, did this in 99. So they, they um, taped some people playing basketball. It was a black team and a white team. And they asked people to take to watch the two players, sorry, to watch the two teams. And halfway through the game, this guy in a gorilla suit sort of walked across and sort of stood in the middle of the screen and then walked off again. And this gorilla suit, in the middle of this basketball game, was on screen for about nine seconds. Um, and only 43% of people actually noticed that this gorilla had walked across um, in the middle of the game. The paper's called Gorillas in Our Midst. If you Google for it, you can find it. And there's been a pile of similar um, studies that people have done on this. And, and as I said, it's an entire science called inattentional blindness. So what happens is that people are focusing on the particular target they need, they're interested in, and basically weeding out everything else. A more common example of this is, you know, you hear of accidents. Someone's driving down the road, they hit a cyclist. And they say, I didn't see the cyclist right in front of me. And that's an example of inattentional blindness because they've got this automatic process that's sorry, the, yeah, automatic process that's scanning for you know traffic signs and traffic lights and other cars and so on and so forth. What it's not scanning for is cyclists, and so they run into the cyclist without even seeing them. And again, this is what makes it possible for humans to function. Um, it's like singular evaluation. This isn't a bug. This is actually required for humans in order to function. So at the very high level, you've got the sensors. They're filtering out light and sound and so on and so forth. Um, an example that anyone who was around yesterday evening would have noticed is the so-called cocktail party phenomenon. You're in this incredibly noisy, crowded room, and you can pick out the one conversation that you're interested in because your brain is filtering out all the other noise in the background. So humans have basically learned to focus on what's important, um, things like flashing lights and, and wild animals and whatnot. So in the case of a browser, you've got this tiny little padlock. It's simply nothing, something that evolution has never conditioned us to, not to notice as being important, and so we don't notice it. So in terms of phishing, um, if you want to mount a phishing attack, don't worry about these security indicators. Most users simply won't notice them. And the few that do notice them won't know what they signify. Um, there are security toolbars which try and make this a bit more obvious. So you've got this big toolbar um, rather than a tiny padlock and an HTTPS. On the other hand, first of all, most of them aren't installed by default. So you've got to actually know about them and go out and find them and install them as plugins, which the typical uh, phishing victim is not going to know about. And in any case, um, even with all that, again, there's been a study on this, and about 39% of users, even with these toolbars and all the other indicators, were still fooled. And also, again, you've got US banks who are training very hard to, uh, or sorry, working very hard to train users to ignore all this stuff. So let's just sort of revisit this thing about why users can't secu get security right. Um, it's not actually that users are idiots, it's that security people are weirdos. The um, you know, sort of human conditioning, human evolution, and so on, has trained people to ignore padlocks, to ignore HTTPS, and so on and so forth. So only security people whose minds work very differently from the rest of the population would actually stop and look at the padlock and check certificates and so on and so forth. 
No normal person would ever actually handle a user interface that way. So the reason why you have browsers built this way is that they're built by security people. And the, the, you know, the, 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 the um, coders writing this stuff assume that everybody else will also use this in the same way as they do, not realizing that there's some you know, sort of eight standard deviations off, off what anyone else would normally do. There was one um, study on PKI usability which found that um, the researchers who ran the study took about two and a half minutes to do this, some certificate-based operation. The typical users, these, were, these weren't even normal, you know, Joe Sixpack. These were actually people with PhDs in computer security. And they were given this sort of paint-by-numbers series of steps on what to do. It took about two and a half hours to do the same thing. Um, security researchers who looked at this simply couldn't believe that it would take, in this case, highly skilled technical users, not even, you know, the average person in the street, that long to do it. You know, we designed this. It's supposed to be simple to use. How can anyone possibly find it this hard to use? So another thing that CAs have been doing recently, or trying to do, um, it will probably be appear in, in sort of the next release, major reefs of the browsers, is to introduce these things called high assurance certificates. So what the high assurance means is you've got a high level of assurance that they're going to cost about five times as much as the existing certificates will. The thing with CAs is, you know, all they can do is issue certificates. So if you want more security, well, we'll charge you more for certificates and claim that they're more secure. Again, the problem with this is that most users don't even know what a CA is. Um, geeks know about it, and that's about it. Um, and even going beyond the average user, um, I don't know if there's anyone on earth who actually knows all 40 to 50 CAs that are hard-coded into their web browser. Some of them have been in there for years and years, and you know, whoever it was, it was that approved those CAs going in there have moved on to other jobs. So there are so many CAs in there, nobody actually knows what all of those things are. And particularly in terms of brand power, if you've got the most insignificant mainstream brand, they've got more visibility and more presence than the most significant main, uh, CA brand. So again, from a user study, um, users were asked which brands they recognized. And the outcome of this was that more people recognized Visa as a trusted CA than VeriSign. Well, the problem is Visa isn't even a CA, and VeriSign is the world's largest CA. So basically, CAs, even if you know what they are, the actual brand recognition is close to zero. Fishing tip from that is kind of obvious. Create a self-signed certificate, make it your own CA, call it Visa. Um, People recognize Visa, doc, Visa, they don't necessarily recognize VeriSign. And certify your site. OK, so you've got HTTPS Visa.com. It's certified by the Visa CA. Of course, it's got to be the real thing. <laughs> so another thing that's being added to browsers is phishing blacklists. Um, and this is going to appear in the next revs of both Internet Explorer and Firefox. So if you go to uh, Marcus Random's website, he's a, he's a really cool security person. He's got this list of the six dumbest ideas in computer security. Um, blacklists are number two on his list. It's, he, he, he generalizes this as enumerating badness. Um, in fact, it's actually a special case of, of the default allow, which is the number one dumbest idea. So sidestepping this, is, it's pretty trivial. You know, just avoid the blacklist. Um, the anti-phishing working group reports that the average site lifetime at the moment is about, phishing site lifetime is about five days. Um, now, to get that onto a blacklist, it's probably going to take a lot longer than that. Spammers are already using websites with six-hour lifetime. So what they do is they send out the spam, wait about six hours, register the site so there's something there once people get into work in the morning and check their mail. Six hours later, the site's gone. So the chances of a phishing blacklist responding within six hours of the site appearing, particularly if it appears at you know, two in the morning, are pretty low. Um, another way of getting around it, which phishing sites are already doing, is just run a reverse proxy via a botnet. So instead of having to blacklist one single site, you've got 10,000 uh, owned PCs. There's constantly changing array of IP addresses. You can't blacklist all of those. So basically, blacklists are, well, you know, they're in there because it's something. It's, it's better than doing nothing at all. But the actual effect is going to be close to zero. So an argument I've heard with this is, OK, blacklists work with virus scanners. So why shouldn't they work with phishing? And that's you know, the people actually pushing these, these phishing blacklists are actually using these arguments. Well, the problem is that a virus scanner, it's got about 100,000 fixed files on disk. It just reads through all of those and finds a virus. Um, even then, the most popular scanners have an 80% uh, miss rate. What happens is people download the latest copy of Norton off the net. If you're writing a virus, you tune it so Norton doesn't detect it. You would then release your virus. Um, now, to block phishing, you've got, I don't know, a billion odd um, internet connected machines. I don't know what the actual count is. They're constantly changing, moving around, and so on and so forth. The only way you can actually somehow blacklist all the things out there is to monitor every single machine all the time to detect when it's been owned by, by some phishing guy. So really, it's, this is never going to work. Basically, yeah, nothing to worry about. 
Um, just make sure your site, site isn't around long enough for it to get blacklisted. If, if anyone's into sort of World War history, in, Ger in World War II Germany built this bunch of super guns that the Gustav Gerät and that the Karl and Thor um, mortars. And these actually helped the enemy because they diverted resources away from the main attack into manning and, and shifting and moving and firing these guns. So it actually helped the bad guy, well, helped the enemy in this case, but in the case of fishing, um, working on these blacklists, again, is diverting resources away from actually really combating fishing. It's helping the bad guys because instead of taking proper security measures, you, you're fiddling with these blacklists. So basically a summary of the previous tips. Um, create your own CA for a well-known brand. People will recognize that more than any major CA. If you've got a fishing site, certify it using the CA. Take advantage of the fact that you know, people trust site, a site if it's got a certificate. Indirect fishing at the moment isn't too necessary because direct fishing is still um, too easy to do. Make it as close to as possible to the real thing. You've got confirmation bias working on your side. Leverage the watermark fallacy, so copy flash and fancy animated graphics in as much detail as you possibly can. Target US financial institutions, your best friend if you're a fisher. Um, copy the US banking disclaimer, so make sure that when people click on the padlock, they get the actual you know, Bank of America or whatever message saying, there's no security here, but trust us anyway. Don't worry about security indicators. Okay, some people, it's going to help some people, but there's no, uh, enough people simply won't even notice it that you'll still be successful in phishing. Um, yeah, short-lived sites, reverse proxies. Um, and the final thing is you only need a 1% success rate in order for it to work. The defenders need about a 100% success rate, which at the moment they're not getting anywhere near. If you want these slides, they're available on my homepage. Um, I've also got an incredibly long usability tutorial. I'm actually going to be traveling for the next week, so they're not up yet. Wait about a week, and you can get the slides from my homepage. And um, there's also a long tutorial on, on potential countermeasures. So I've you know, talked about all the attacks here. The countermeasures are a lot more complicated and take a lot more time to talk about. But yeah, wait a week, and I'll have the slides up. <coughs> OK, any questions? No questions? Okay, that's it then. Thanks. Uh, I had a question. I had a question. Why can't Congress pass a law making it necessary for U.S. companies using secure sites to use valid certificates from a recognized list of CAs in order for it to be accessible by a browser? I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, one of the problems is that you would be legally enforcing a monopoly. The, the fact that you said a recognized list of CAs, um, I don't know, whether the, you know what would happen if the government tried to legally enforce a monopoly of a small number of CAs. Um, but yeah the, yeah, the question is, I don't know. Um, software industry lobbying, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that, sorry. I just wanted to make a clarification with American Express. Uh, their sites not, or their certificate's not invalid. Their homepage is hosted by Akamai, which is where the site, um, the ah, cert's issued. Okay. <laughs> but again, it, it further, uh, you know, obfuscates the real problem. It makes it more difficult to navigate the terrain. So, I appreciate it. Uh, this, this is a little off of, uh, I guess, your area of focus. But have you run into any sort of studies on the installation of adware and spyware? Um, and people like agreeing to things that are actually somewhere embedded, maybe in a EULA, or it's somewhere on there, but they just, you know, just click through, get through it, and uh, installation. Have you run into any studies related to that? And I don't know if it's been studied specifically, but you know, the, the principles are exactly the same as what you're getting in phishing. Yeah, this, this message pops up, and they want to install a program. They don't really care about some stupid EULA or whatever. And you know, the automatic processing kicks in. They've got the stimulus dialog box with an OK. Click get rid of it and install the spyware. So yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. I've got a comment about the um, banking login. It's, it's actually both better and worse than the way you painted it. Um, if you look at the source on those bank login pages, a lot of times uh, it won't be SSL for entering your username and password, but when you click OK, uh, the actual form post is an SSL. Um, yeah, but that, that doesn't matter because if you go to a website and you enter your username and password, you want to know it's the real bank. Oh, yeah, SSL absolutely. Or to, you know, to authenticate the web page, it doesn't really matter. I, I, I fully agree. And actually, I work at a, 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 long, a, a large online bank, and I fought that very battle and convinced our marketing department to not implement that kind of login page. Right. So. Yeah, well, one of the reasons for mentioning this is hopefully by pointing this out and, and you know, sort of 
pointing big signs at it, banks will fix that. It's, it's all about user conditioning, like you, like you were saying. And if, um, if users are accustomed to entering their username and password for their financial transactions on a non-secure page. Right, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. I'd like to know if there's any um, help in third-party hardware devices uh, for the masses that they would set before their firewalls that claim to effectively be able to uh, filter fissures and key loggers coming in the door so that would prevent that aspect of the attack? Again, it's a blacklisting, it's, it's the blacklisting problem. In order to filter phishing, you know, sort of in your router or whatever, you need a blacklist of sites that you don't allow in. And that, that, that runs into the blacklist, pro blacklist problem. You know, you use a reverse proxy and you can't filter that anymore. Do you think that uh, with VeriSign becoming bigger, like acquiring GeoTrust and growing, that eventually something like that will become habitual to users? Or do you think that that's not going to be a solution in the future? I don't think it'll become visible. If you look at, you know, the, like the big credit card companies and banks, they're spending, I don't know what they spend, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on advertising. And, and you know, every, every airport you walk into and so on, you've got these huge posters, Visa, MasterCard, whatever. Uh, VeriSign simply can't compete with that. Um, I'm really interested in just uh, like the web of trust, PGP type stuff, and I'm trying to merge the two ideas in a sense. I mean, we're looking at a central authority, all the trust is dictated from this one site. Is there any way you can envision um, this kind of merger? And I'm thinking also, instead of contrary to the blacklist where, you know, if we get a, a certificate from Verizon or, and they say, okay, instantly we trust this site, how about we, we build trust over time and some clients can see that people have signed this site over time, they can verify timestamps over time. I'm trying to think of like a page rank kind of algorithm. Uh, what do you, and is there serious problems with this distributed um, web of trust, or what do you think about something like that? It's subvertible, it would help a lot. Um, the problem with measures like that is once you start building them in, they become a target for the bad guys and they subvert them. Like you already get this on eBay, where some, you know, f people open like a thousand bogus sites and create bogus transactions and leave positive feedback for the one, you know, phishing user. And so they'll get a thousand positive feedbacks and people will trust them. And, and you know, it's a page rank thing based on users voting on whether a site is good or not. Um, has this, it is subvertible, but it is, yeah, it's a good idea until the bad guy. Sorry? It has to be built securely in a sense. I mean, it's not suitable. It's, yeah, the problem is you then, you're then you doing adding a layer of security complexity. You know, you need someone to manage this and maintain it. And the, the real problem is the user interface, not so much the, the nuts and bolts behind it. You know, in theory, it's a good idea. And if you can put a really, really good user interface on it, it would be good. But the, 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 all of these attacks are user interface attacks, not so much security mechanisms. Like with SSL, it's working exactly as intended. The problem is the user, not the, not the crypto. Um, I've got a question more from the uh, registry side to prevent phishing, because I work for registry in that particular section. Um, what about a group looking for future fraud trends, future phishing trends, and then cutting them off at the past by making sure that these words, these phrases are watched over, and when these things are purchased, then tracked? So like if it, you know, a lot of companies like VeriSign, GoDaddy, um, NameDomain.com, if you buy anything that says Visa, SSL, um, eBay, they're on you. That, that gets flagged, it goes to a department, they're searching it, they're checking it, they're making sure the credit cards are real, they're making sure all this information is real. If it's not, well, they've got a little thing in their disclaimer that says, uh-uh, I own this, not you, you're just leasing it, take it back. Now you don't have access to that domain name making phishing that much harder. What about a group getting together trying to find these trends and then cutting them off at the past? That works to some extent. You know, there's a whole pile of, of sort of measures that people are taking that help. The problem is that if users are going to trust a self-signed certificate, you can make yourself anyone you want and it doesn't really have to be, you know, that's the honesty box problem. You just create your own certificate and, and you can bypass that. Okay, I guess that's it. Thanks.